Hi, Miranda. I am so happy to have you on the show today. I am so excited to share you with my listeners. And we definitely have some things in agreement about fitness and diet culture. So I am super excited to dive into our conversation today. How are you? I'm great, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me on. I I can't wait to see what we talk about. Yes, absolutely. Well, if you don't mind, I would love to just dive right in and just if you could just share a little bit about your story about how you were able to really repair your your own personal relationship with your food with a maybe a lifetime of your relationship with food. Tell me um, and my listeners more about that. Yeah, so I'm a faith-based health and confidence coach now, but, um, you know, it took me a while to get to where I am, where, you know, I have food freedom, where I've really surrendered everything over to God, where I've realized that there's so much more to me than just my body, what I look like, what I weigh, what my pant size is, how many calories I'm eating, what uh, the amount of macros I'm eating, all these things that I used to be obsessed with. Um, I'm not, but it took so many years and Honestly, I I remember it as far back as, I mean, even kindergarten, when the boy I had a crush on told me, asked me, why are you fat? And I was like, oh, so that's when I first realized, you know, being more self-conscious about my body and how much I weighed. And then, you know, in the fifth grade is kind of when I started, um, just extreme dieting, like only eating like vegetable soup or hard hard boiled eggs. And then at recess, I would run a mile every day at recess. And um, I mean, looking back at it now, and whenever I tell people, they're like, oh my gosh, like that's horrible. But back then when I was doing it, it was praised. You know, there would be the adults in my life, other people saying, wow, you're so disciplined. Like you've lost so much weight. Like you look so great. And that was kind of the start of my disordered eating habits, which led to eating disorders and just extreme yo-yo dieting that continued um, like into my early 20s. Um, And I don't know if anyone else or probably a lot of people can relate that like I didn't even think anything I was doing was wrong. Like I thought it was normal because I was being praised because of diet culture, because of what society was saying. And even though I was honestly just obsessed and um, just miserable, I thought this was what life was supposed to be. So, you know, I ended up struggling really bad with binge eating disorder and then struggling um, with orthorexia as well. And, you know, it, it even went to into college when I started, um, competitive boxing where like your weight is really important. So I'd have to cut 30 pounds for a fight in six weeks and I would do it. And people, you know, would praise me and say like how good I looked and how disciplined I was. And that's where I got my, my worth from. That's where I thought, um, like these were the things that made me enough was being the smallest version of myself was working out for hours and hours a day under eating all these things. And that's not what God put me on this earth to do. And, you know, it wasn't until I completely opened up to my, my husband about it. Um, he was just my boyfriend and fiance at the time when, um, I noticed his relationship with food was just so normal. What's normal now? Like he, if he was hungry, he would eat. And if he was not hungry, he'd stop. And it was just, it was crazy to me that someone could have a bag of chips in their cabinet and it could last them like a week and he wouldn't obsess over food. And if he wanted something, he would just eat it until he was satisfied. And then like the fact that he could listen to his hunger cues, I was like, this is a thing. What the heck? So then I started opening up about kind of what I was feeling and the things that I was struggling with and realized that that's not normal counting every calorie. I remember wanting some tortilla chips with my Chipotle order. And I had to do like an hour on the bike first before I had it. Cause I feel like I had to earn it. Mm-hmm. And these are just, just horrible, 
Like it's just a horrible mindset to have. And you don't even have to have like an eating disorder because these are just disordered eating habits and thoughts that diet culture has really normalized. So it wasn't until, you know, I fully surrendered it over to God. Um, you know, I got help, went to therapy, was really devoted um, to like reading these like self-help books to help overcome um, these struggles that I had and just be patient. And, you know, it, it took, it took a while. People think that they can undo five, 10, 15, 20 years of dieting overnight. Like it took, took years, but I mean, I've never been happier. And I think people are scared that if they let go of dieting, that they'll just let go of themselves and their, their health. And I think I'm the healthiest that I've ever been because I've found that balance and I, I live in the gray area instead of, you know, having that all or nothing mindset. So that's kind of how I got to where I am today. Yeah. And I, I really think that that we each have that pivotal moment, right? We have that, that story that affects us when it comes to how we perceive food, how we look at food. Um, Do we look at food as nutrition? Are we, I like to say to my clients, like, are you eating to live or are you living to eat? Because there is a difference and you don't want to be Um, you know, living to eat, and then you're just grabbing whatever you want. And it's just like a, an endless um, food fest party whenever you want it, when meanwhile, your body is showing signs of suffering from the choices that you're making. So I think that that's really important that you have your story that you walked your walk through that so that then you can help other um, women and maybe even some men too um, go through their journey so that they can find food freedom really. And I want to, I want to ask you your opinion on, because I think a lot of this starts in high school, you're started even earlier. And I, I think, I think it is trending more towards younger and younger children. Um, but also when they start playing sports, when we all start playing sports, that becomes a big issue. So I think about the football player that then plays, um, then does wrestling, right, on the off season, or the runner that also plays soccer. Like you've, you're constantly fixated on what you are eating and how what you're eating is causing you to perform. And so how, how would you kind of give some advice to that high schooler or that college student that um, is struggling with that? You know, maybe they're yo-yo yoing like for for football they have to be a certain weight, but then for wrestling they have to lose all that weight. So like that can really tax your metabolism. So is there a chance to get it back? I guess is what I'm asking. Is there a chance to get that metabolism back to a healthy balance? Yeah, there's, oh, there's so many things I want to say about what you just said, because like, I don't even blame like solely the sports because I mean, sometimes it does come with the territory. Like I did enjoy my years of boxing. You know, I did have years of marathon running and yeah, marathon running is great, but it's not good for your body. It's not a long-term thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really hard on your body. So I think like being able to recognize that, but I think one of the things that I really blame is like the PE classes in, um, in high school where they take your BMI, like your height and your weight. And like, you know, I, I remember them saying like, all right, your grade is based off of if you, you know, the next couple of weeks you can get down to, um, you know, a better BMI or you fall within the acceptable range. And that's just so frustrating because first of all, we all know BMI is a bunch of baloney. It's not right. accurate. I mean, even these football players too, like these guys are performing and they have to put on muscle. So for someone to like take their height and weight and tell them like, Oh, well, you're obese. Like it's not accurate at all. It doesn't the BMI doesn't take into, doesn't take so many things into consideration, like your muscle mass, um, you know, your genetics, your age, your lifestyle, like there's so many things that it doesn't um, take into consideration. So I feel like this is, these are the things that kind of carry over into the sports where we think, all right, this is what matters. Um, you know, there, it, 
sports like wrestling and fighting where you do have to lose weight, like, oh, that it, it can really mess with your mindset. So I think if people were properly, um, I guess, educated on the subject and um, they just had better leadership, you know, people who like the PE coaches or, or the coaches of the sports, if they were just better educated in, you know, nutrition and fitness. So, you know, they could, you know, teach their, their students and their athletes, like, all right, like we, like food is fuel and food is medicine. Um, Food is not just calories in versus calories out. That's not what we should be obsessing about. So, you know, I think just kids in high school, especially are given the wrong idea because then we get out of high school or even get out of college and we're not playing three different sports. And then we wonder why our body isn't as um, lean or thin or quote unquote in shape as it was when we were in high school or playing sports in college. Yeah, you, that's all you did. Like that was literally your life. Like you went to school and then you went to practice and then you went to practice again. And then you went to a game like that's what your life was. So of course you looked a certain way. Maybe you felt a certain way, but now you don't know how to properly nourish your body. You don't know how to work out for health instead of performance. So we just aren't given the right tools. And to answer basically your original question, like, yes, there's hope for our metabolism, you know, but like I said earlier, if you've been doing something for all these years, it's going to take time and you can't, you can't heal these things overnight and you have to be willing to put in the effort but a lot of it is really mindset it's not even really about the food and the exercise it's about our mental relationship with it because if we just see exercise as a way to lose weight or a way to burn off the calories that maybe we ate um and we see exercise as a punishment instead of you know um, celebration of what our body can do then it's just, it's all, it's just all messed up in our head. No wonder we have these horrible relationships with food and exercise once we get out of high school or college. It, yeah, it is so true. And, and that's the thing um, that I love about your message that there actually is freedom in food. There's food freedom. I can't tell you how many um clients and patients have that have come to me that have struggled because of a lifetime of food um, bondage, really bondage, bondage all wrapped up into their food from what their um, parents instituted, their grandparents being members of the clean plate club. I mean, like all of that, it's so emotional. Food is so emotional. And so once we break through that, then we are actually able to have food freedom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, food freedom. Wow, I, it is the best feeling ever. And unfortunately, when it comes to um, like food addiction, it's not something you can just give up. Like if you were addicted to alcohol or smoking or anything else where it's like, you can live without it. You cannot live without food. So you're kind of forced to either continue down this path of food addiction and not healing that relationship or healing it and finding that food freedom. And, you know, what it means to have food freedom is not letting food take control of your life. It shouldn't be on your mind 24 seven. Um, there shouldn't be any guilt associated with food. And, you know, a lot of the main reason why people don't have food freedom is because of what diet culture has taught us. You know, diet culture teaches us that certain foods are good and certain foods are bad. Um, And there's no such thing as good or bad food. Like food has no moral value because I guarantee you, if you were to eat kale for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you would have major nutrient deficiencies. The same as if you were eating, you know, cupcakes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so, you know, just lots of bloating. (laughs) Yeah. Lots of bloating. bloating. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a time and a place for, for all these foods. You know, I think there's a time and a place for cupcakes or chocolate or donuts, and there's a time and a place for 
you know, kale and almond milk and cauliflower rice. And it's, we, we love, um, we as people love like these strict set of rules because we think that we can't mess them up. So that's why people are so fast to hop on to diets because diets say, okay, you can do this. You can't do that. This is a yes. This is a no. You're allowed to eat this food. You can't eat that food. You eat between these hours or whatever. And with food freedom and learning to intuitively eat and listen to your body, it's going to vary day by day. And it really relies on listening to your hunger cues, learning when you are satisfied, um, when you are full and more being in tune with yourself individually, instead of like this general like diet that just gives you these strict rules. I think that's why people are just like, I'm going to do this diet because I can't mess up. And, but we all do because diets aren't meant to be forever. They're not meant for, you know, just living a normal life where there's holidays and there are weekends and there are bad mental health days and there are celebrations. All these things are reasons for us to fall off the wagon or start over again on Monday. One, in reality, if you have food freedom and you've built this healthy relationship with food, you won't be stressed out about a weekend, about Thanksgiving, about you know, being stressed or struggling with something in your life because you have this healthy relationship with food and you don't need to rely on these strict set of rules that a diet has given you that first of all, why would you do something that's not even enjoyable? You know, like food, food is meant to be enjoyed as well. Food is great. Why do you think all, all these holidays revolve around food? Why do you think all these like different cultures and celebrations, like everyone's sitting around a dinner table eating together, like food is meant to be enjoyed. You know, food goes beyond being fuel and it goes beyond being medicine as well. Like food is meant to be enjoyed and it's meant to bring you and other people together. But if you're obsessing about food or you're even overeating where you're not even enjoying the food, then where's that healthy balance? And that's where food freedom comes into play because food should not take control of your life and your mind and your relationships as well. That's exactly it. That is, that is so pivotal because I think once we realize that, we recognize that, we get that deep into our, our psyche and our, our emotional and mental state, we can truly then relax. And when I worked at the diet, um, the weight loss clinic, oh my goodness, I was always bucking the system, the rules of that place, because I knew number one, that diets don't work. So even though it wasn't a horrible program, there were still a lot of things that were not sustainable. And I'm all about sustainable eating, intuitive eating, learning to listen to your body, exactly what you were saying. And so, you know, teaching that there is freedom, that it's okay, because if you go to that graduation party and you feel deprived, what's going to happen in the middle of the night after you were quote unquote good, right? You obeyed the rules of the diet and you didn't do anything off plan, but then in the middle of the night, you cannot stop thinking about that cake or that whatever. So what do you do? A lot of women will go in to the kitchen and they'll binge. And then it sets up that cycle of self-loathing and just, I can't, and I shouldn't. And it's just such a, a perfect storm that needs to be calmed like and it starts within us we have to we have to be willing to take that first step and say no I am going to change my relationship with my food so talk about that how do we ditch the diet mentality how do we just ignore diet culture yeah so you know there there is this diet cycle where you know we diet And then, you know, we overeat and then we feel guilty. So then we diet again and then we overeat and it's just this constant cycle. And we all think that, all right, to break the cycle, I'm going to stop at the overeating. And no, that's not, (laughs) you can't just go in the middle of the cycle. If you want to break the cycle, you have to stop at step number one, which is dieting. 
stop dieting because dieting is what leads to overeating. We all think that when it comes to, you know, losing weight or being healthy, that it's all about willpower. <laughs> no, there, it, it's not. I mean, let's say you have a certain specific goal and there might be a itty bitty tiny percent of willpower, but diets have taught us that it's literally like 99% willpower. And if you are lacking willpower, then you are weak and you are a failure. Yeah, I can't like, I literally can't even remember the last time, like I needed to rely on willpower. Like, like why? Like it's, it's not meant for every day, every meal, everything that you want to eat. So stop relying on willpower. If you want to break this, this dieting cycle, this dieting binge eating cycle, stop with the dieting. And yeah, like, like I've said many times, if you've been dieting for five, 10, 15, 20 years, it's not going to happen overnight. So right. if you've been yo-yo dieting and now you're like, all right, I'm going to ditch dieting and I'm going to stop obsessing over food. Well, guess what? You're probably going to overeat in the beginning because your body has been taught that, you know what? I'm probably not going to be able to eat later on because I'm probably going to diet again. So your body's in in survival mode because you're constantly starving your body and then overeating and then feeling guilty about it. So yeah, in the beginning, when you were trying to listen to your body, you've been ignoring these hunger cues and all these different things that your body tells us for so many years. So yeah, your body doesn't trust you and you don't trust your body. So it's, it's going to take time, but instead of being like, oh man, I overate you know, I'm trying not to diet and I overate, like, how about the little wins of, Hey, I overate, but I've, I, my body is telling me that I overate. This is a message that my body is sending me. This is a little win. This is, this is what I realized. I think that if I would have, let's say stopped eating like one or two chicken breasts ago, or, you know, maybe if I would have stopped after one or two cupcakes, instead of eating four or five cupcakes, I think I would have been a little more satisfied. So, you know, really focusing on those little wins because we think that we can hate ourselves into loving ourselves in the future. And that's not how it works. Like if you're trying to teach your kid how to ride a bike and every time they fall off, you're like, you suck. You're never going to learn how to ride a bike. Your kids can be like, all right, yeah, you're right. I don't want to learn how to ride a bike. But when your kid like goes maybe a little bit further, you're like, yes, you've got this, you're doing great. Or maybe they totally mess, mess up and they don't even, they, they get on the bike and then they fall. They don't even move. You're like, it's okay. It happens. you got this. Like, this is what's going to get your kid to learn how to ride a bike. So we need to do that with ourselves. There are going to be days where I guess you can say you mess up. I don't even think it's like, it's literally just life. There might be days where you overeat or you fall into old habits but having food freedom and learning how to intuitively eat, it's all about the journey where diets have taught us it's all about the destination. I don't ever want to get to like this final stage in my fitness journey because I want it to go forever. And my journey isn't trying to be the smallest version of myself either. My journey has changed with different phases of my life with things like COVID happening with me moving, with me graduating from college, with me starting this business, all these things are, I'm going to have different priorities. And, you know, my body might change at different times as well. I might be, you know, training for one sport where I am really prioritizing um, like the nutrients and the more um, fuel aspect of what I'm eating. And then it might be another point in my life where like right now I'm eight months pregnant and I'm really just trying to, trying to eat because I have no appetite whatsoever. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm honoring my body and my hunger cues and I'm prioritizing, um, you know, the, the nutrient dense foods, but also if I am, you know, craving some ice cream that I don't feel guilty about it. So it's all about finding that balance of, you know, where are you in your life? And it's going to change. We, our entire life shouldn't be about trying to lose weight. That, 
Amen. What a hor- what a horrible way to live life. First of all, that sounds horrendous. And right. especially as women, we we're taught that we need to be the smallest version of ourselves, literally, figuratively, everything. And I have so much more to offer the world than, you know, wearing a size four in jeans or whatever. And like, no one's going to say that at my funeral. No one's going to be like, I'm so glad she lost those last 10 pounds. Like no one cares. So why are we obsessed about it? Right. No, that's true. And it goes back to the emotional part of it, the component, the emotional component. And until we do that deep dive into um, getting to the root problem, the root cause and getting and facing those emotions, we're always going to struggle. So um, yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, the fact that you have this, this podcast that you've gone through all of these different phases in your life, it's so it's very, um, very much helping the women that listen to you to feel empowered themselves, that they can ditch diet culture, that they can absolutely find food freedom for their own selves. Because here's the thing, as a midlife woman, like there are, our bodies change so much. Like we will never get back to what we were high school weight and we shouldn't even be trying. We really shouldn't. And so and, and I say that because I've heard that I have heard adult women in their forties and fifties say that they want to get back to what they weighed in their twenties. And it's really unhealthy because our bodies are constantly changing. We're going through all these different phases and stages and, and then you get into midlife and you've got hormonal you know, changes and everything. And we just need to embrace where we are at each stage of our lives. And so I think that that's wonderful that you are encouraging um, your, your people, your community to do that. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I do hear that a lot where people are like, oh, I want to get back to my high school size. And it's like, okay. And what, because you think about back when you wore a certain size jeans or you weighed a certain amount and okay, that's all we focus on. But why don't we dig deeper and like, who, who were you at that, that age and at that size? Like, what have you gained in these past 10, 20, 30 years? You know, if I just look back at an old picture of myself where I was a smaller version of myself, all I'm looking at is the outside, but what about the inside? Like, what have I gained since then besides maybe some weight? Like, okay, I've gained, a master's degree since that picture, you know, I've gained more self-confidence. Um, you know, I'm growing my family. Like I own a house, like all these little things that we don't even look at when we look at these older pictures of ourselves. And it's like, okay, you want to go back to that high school version of yourself. What about all these other things in your life that you are going to lose? So we need to stop just looking at what we can physically see on the outside and focus. Like what are other things that we've that, you know, we've gained to be this new and improved version of ourselves that goes way beyond weight and pant size. And I just want to say for anyone listening, if you are holding on to any pair of pants is like my gold pants, my gold jeans or whatever, get like, get rid of it. It's not serving you. It could be serving someone else, donate it, give to someone, you know, give it to goodwill because it is taking up space. It is not a healthy reminder in your life because you have so much more to work toward than trying to fit into these pair of jeans. And I promise you, when if you do ever fit back into those pair of jeans, it's not going to be as exciting as you think. You'll be excited for a couple minutes and then the rest of it is, oh no, I, what if I, what if I gain the weight back and I don't fit into these jeans? Clothes are meant to fit you. You were not meant to fit clothes. So if something doesn't fit you, get rid of it and go shopping. I love that so much because, um, yeah, I do. I love that so much because it's so true. You know, we, we aspire to fit into this one pair of jeans that we've been hanging on for years, maybe, and then we'll put them on, but we still find fault. That's the thing. We're still finding fault with ourselves. Yes. We were able to zip them up. Yes. That's wonderful. But there's still that voice in our head where we're finding fault. Maybe it's our muffin top. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So it's, sometimes it is better 
to start fresh and just get rid of, I mean, what do they say? If you're holding on to something for a year and you never use it, get rid of it. That is so true. Very, very true when it comes to our clothing, because it has such a negative connotation attached to it. Yeah, it, it really does. And it's just taking up space physically and, and mentally. And yep. once again, this is something that diet culture has taught us. Like, like I, I remember like seeing pictures of like a girl trying to button her jeans and she, and she couldn't. And it was like nothing, um, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And all, like all these things uh. that diet culture has just in, ingrained into our, our mind that we think is important. So if we want to ditch diet culture, we have to get rid of basically the things that diet culture has been telling us, like to keep that pair, that gold pair of jeans, or have you ever like gone out and you're like, oh, this is a little snug, but it's so cute. Uh, I'm going to get it because once I lose those five or 10 pounds, it'll look perfect. No, <laughs> if it doesn't fit you. Don't buy it. And right. you know what? No, no one's walking around with a giant, like, this is a size small. This is a size extra large. Like, no one cares what the size is, but you know, if your booty's hanging out of your shorts because you got a size or two too small, hoping that one day you'll fit into it, that's what people are seeing. So just buy clothes that fit you. And if it doesn't fit you, donate it, give it to someone else, get it out of your house because all it's doing is just feeding into diet culture and what they think makes you worthy or not worthy. Right. Right, exactly. And, you know, just like we want to feel comfortable in our own skin, we want to feel comfortable in the clothes that we put on. We absolutely do. Yeah, I think that's great. I think you have a wonderful message. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Um, I think the last thing is just remember that, you know, you are the only person that you spend 100% of your life with. So why not choose to love yourself? Because, If you talk to your best friend the way you talk to yourself, your friend probably wouldn't want to be friends with you. So, you know, we we live in, in, we live in a world where, you know, we want to talk bad to ourselves, where we think it's wrong to be confident or love who you are and the body that that you're in and what you have to offer the world. But no, like you're the only person you're going to spend your entire life with. So you might as well love yourself at all versions, all phases, all sizes everything because at the end of the day it's you and you you go to sleep in your body and you wake up in your body so why not learn to love yourself that's right I agree with that 100 percent. that's right well to have a little fun um I I didn't give you a heads up I was going to do this <laughs> oh, no. but I just want to put you in the hot seat just um talking about all of this um food and food freedom and everything Can I ask, what is your favorite decadent dessert? Maybe you're not so guilty pleasure because we don't want to have guilt attached to it. So what's your favorite decadent dessert? Ooh, that's hard. I like anything with chocolate. Like yes, anything, unless it's ice cream, I'm more of a a vanilla based girl, but then, you know, I'll put like the chocolate on top. (laughs) I don't know anything chocolate, like brownies with some vanilla ice cream on top that's good I mean don't even limit it to dessert like donuts are good (laughs) anything with chocolate I love me some dark chocolate and I think the worst part of my life was my first trimester where I had an aversion to chocolate and I couldn't eat chocolate because it sounded so gross and I was like my life is over I have chocolate every day I have chocolate in my fridge all the time I couldn't eat it because it just sounded so gross. I would like smell it on people's breath and I'd be like, but that that horrible time in my life is over and we were back to loving (laughs) chocolate. So we're good. (laughs) I think that is so funny. Yeah, that's so true. That would, that would hurt me too, because I am a definite, definite chocoholic. I love my chocolate so much. I have my favorite bars that I buy, the endangered species, uh, dark chocolate bars. Yes, I love it. It's my favorite. And so, um, you know, in my very disciplined days when um, I had to be disciplined because I was, the emotions were all over the place. And if I wasn't, then, 
you know, I could eat that whole bar. I would just break off, you know, two or three squares and I would just savor it. I think that's the key is savoring your chocolate, not just wolfing it down and, and chewing it and being done with it. You need to get the the connection to your brain that you are enjoying this, that this is something that's enjoyable. It's, it's savory. Um, it's just so delicious and you really are enjoying it. So that's the key. I used to always go in the bathroom with my little square of dark chocolate, you know, when I had the kids around and it was my peaceful time. <laughs> so chocolate has always been my go-to for sure. Yeah. I think it really depends on the day. Sometimes two little squares of chocolate are great. Sometimes half the chocolate bar is great. So whatever my body's telling me. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And, you know, quality matters. Quality matters. So you, we're not going to get the same kind of um, boost. We're not going to get the same kind of emotional boost and physical boost if we're having subpar quality. So that's why I just love that brand that, you know, that I purchased um, good quality. So that's awesome. That is wonderful. Well, I appreciate you so much coming on the show. Can you just tell, tell the listeners where they can find you and how they can reach out to you? Yeah, it was, it was so great coming on. Thank you for having me. Um, if anyone would like to connect with me, um, I'm mostly on Instagram at this is Miranda Lee. Um, my website is this is and in my email, this is at gmail.com. And then you can also, um, find me on all podcast streaming platforms with, um, the M powered podcast. So M dash powered podcast. Um, but yeah, you can find all that on my website or my Instagram as well. Perfect. That is wonderful. So yeah, guys, check Miranda Lee out and thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been so much fun to talk with you. I think we could have talked for another hour, but it was so good. Um, best wishes on your pregnancy and you've got one more month to go. It's going to be great. (laughs) And I can't wait to see pictures, but thank you so much, Miranda Lee. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, bye-bye.